floor. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so um, I'll. This will be a little bit of a change of speed in terms of where we're focused and where what level we're looking at. Um, I'll, I'll go over the first um, few slides very quickly. Um, and, and this really relates to, I think we, we discussed this a lot this morning about why we're doing 5G. And, um, you know, we mentioned the diversity of devices and everything that's going on. If you look at the, the projections uh, going forward in terms of the number of devices that are going to be connected, um, there's clearly a growth in the number of smartphones or anticipated, but the biggest growth is in the number of M2M-like devices or machine-like devices. This is the whole Internet of Things uh, focus. Uh, in terms of the total um, uh, amount of data that we're carrying, of course, that, that's moving uh, almost uh, hockey stick-like up to the right. Uh, by 2019, we expect um, um, perhaps a factor of six greater um, mobile network data than we're carrying today. Um, so we can ask the question, really, when, you know, is this the motivation for 5G? And of course, the answer is somewhere embedded in that it is, together with a lot of other sort of motivators behind it. Um, but in terms of, and that's what's sort of pushing us towards the definition of 5G right now. Except there's another piece of it where um, it's not just a matter of defining what 5G is, it's a matter of when it gets, de gets deployed also. And that's driven by things that are outside of, of, of technology, perhaps. Um, and in fact, one can expect that operators would continue to try and push 4G um, and push their 4G investment as far as fa as long as possible until really they can't support the breadth of applications that they'd like to support. So the pull is going to come from the market, we believe, um, at least from the service provider perspective. Um, but. Um, uh, we can expect that there's going to be this tug of war between sh is now the right time to invest in 5G uh, versus uh, when to cap the 4G investment. Um, okay. Um, in terms of, of um, timing that's going on in uh, the different domains, uh, you can look between 20, you know, where we are today and 20, 2020, and sort of the, the standards bodies are targeting to have um, the standards sort of defined uh, by the end of this decade, so in the 2020 time frame, at least to the point where we can start doing demos and trials. And then, of course, the market has these, these specific um, uh, targets at uh, the Olympics in Korea and Japan, um, and um, there's also the Etsy definition of when it needs to happen that's driving a lot of this. So this is stuff that's happening outside the market directly, but it's part of the, the standards machine that's moving forward. And of course, there's also the research that's feeding into um, the standards bodies. Um, and that will be just constantly happening. And, and um, OK. Um, so what does this mean? And, and in terms of timing, um, the question is when you sort of cut bait on ideas that you're not quite sure of. and um, and you start to define or build um, the solution around technologies that you're relatively certain that you could go forward with, with uh, development investments on. And the hope is that we don't prematurely rush to that point where we say now is the time that we have to start deciding. Um, um, there's no, you know, our, our tolerance for risk in terms of new technologies has dropped. And um, you know, if we're going to make big investments, we have to sort of do this in a in a in a way that employs con technologies that we're confident in. So our hope, at least at Cisco, is that we have a few years, perhaps, to push some of the more radical thinking, on or at least some of the more high risk thinking on how one might do some of the networking uh, in time for meeting this this kind of time scale. It's kind of uncertain, but that's kind of what we're the way we're looking at it is is let's not, let's not be hasty in terms of how quickly we move into 5G or at least solidifying what 5G is. Um, this sort of summarizes, I think, some of the, the uh, technologies that have been discussed this morning. Um, there's a lot of focus in the community on different access technologies and how one can solve sort of the spectrum problem, the spectral efficiency problem, the availability of bandwidth problem. Uh, and that spans 
of technologies that have been looked at over many, many years, and uh, there's a lot of sophistication, I think a lot of, of uh, good work that's been done in millimeter wave technology. It's actually becoming sort of a tangible reality that that's going to play a role in 5G, which I would say a few years ago people would have been much more skeptical about because of the physics limitations of um, uh, uh, propagation in, in the millimeter bands. Um, the amount of work that's being done in high order MIMO, massive MIMO, lots of signal processing involved there, uh, are all ways of managing interference, about managing coordination between, um, between interacting or interfering cells. Uh, and the goal there is really to drive you know, better capacity and more control um, when you have densely populated areas. New air interfaces, we talked about ultra wideband radios. There was less discussion today, I think, about Cloud RAN. Um, that's a lot of discussion that's going on actually in the community now in terms of uh, centralizing some functions of the radio uh, in an effort to try and commoditize what's deployed uh, in the network or at least in the field. Um, and um, one can look at, at 4G and, and realize that it wasn't a layer one and layer two that was really designed to be cloud RAM friendly or centralized uh, friendly. And so when we look across how one might split a 4G like uh, layer one and layer two, there's a lot of discussion about do we centralize the MAC, do we centralize part of PDCP, do we split the MAC and put some of the scheduler closer to the or in the field and, and keep some of it uh, more localized. And there are puts and takes in terms of, of, of what the gains are and what the cost is of doing that. Typically, the more that's centralized, the greater the penalty or at least the cost of, of, of uh, supporting the front hall of the communication between uh, the centralized processing and the radio, um, remote radio head itself. I, I suspect that that conversation will go on for a long time in 4G. Uh, and it will affect some of our thinking and how we, we decide to deploy or design the layer one and layer twos uh, for whatever, whatever access we have in 5G also. And the reason for that is just the centralization um, has a lot of value to the uh, service provider in terms of maintaining, um, maintaining their network, operating their network, coordinating uh, what goes on between cells, et cetera, that sort of thing. Device-to-device uh, -device communication is something we don't really do a lot of today within, within, um, within the mobile network, but this is something that's becoming increasingly more important, especially when we talk about vehicular sort of applications, that sort of thing. On the mobility core, um, the, the conversations, there's a lot of work that's been done to sort of thinking what the architecture will look like, perhaps. Um, sort of proposals, a lot of it is influenced by the emergence of NFV and, and SDN technologies, which we're doing today. Um, so we shouldn't, we, this is a technology that, that uh, enables sort of a simplification, if you will, not necessarily of the protocols or of the architecture, but at least the flexibility in how the operator deploys and manages their network. So there's a lot of value in, in NFV and SDN in introducing that in that transition that we're moving from today where we have dedicated hardware, software supported, but hardware like gateways into virtualized gateways. And most of the function, or at least most of the motivation there is the agility that an operator gets in deploying networks in this fashion. The fact that they can introduce and manage uh, new features, uh, introduce new services, um, in, in terms of the velocity that that service can be deployed at, and also uh, just the general cost reduction in managing the network. Um, we talked about small cells, um, and again, they're somehow gonna play a role in 5G, although it's uncertain um, what form they'll take. And um, you know, this is the most convenient way of actually getting more capacity um, by, by um, Deploying, uh, you know, um, at least without adding more more um, uh, bandwidth or more complexity. Um, 
there's an interest in, in this, this topic of s simplified small cells is when we, I think there are different ways we can refer to that, but we, we talked um, about the needs of IoT, the needs of specialized devices, uh, maybe don't need all of the complexity and the heavyweight uh, protocols that are required for um, highly mobile devices. And so there's an aspect of how do we drive simplicity into our small cells and hide the complexity and bring it back, uh, deeper into the network perhaps. Make the small cells um, or whatever physical layer and layer two that they're using, make them more like the way we think about Wi-Fi today. And then finally, something I'll spend a little bit more time on is talking about um, the actual communication model that we use um, in the mobile network to support, um, say, thinking a little bit differently about how we design our core network or the entire mobile edge um, to be more focused on information delivery rather than data transport. So this is kind of changing our perspective on how we use the network and what the network, what, what services it's designed to support for us. And so this model really is based on thinking that every application and the way we use the network today is to move information around, to retrieve information, or to provide information to others, not necessarily to provide a connection to, to some other server. So our normal bias in almost every kind of network that we have is to think about establishing a connection and then transferring something rather than, and our interest is in what we're transferring. So building the network in a way or a communication model that's focused on retrieving the information that we're asking for rather than us explicitly defining where that information is located and then using the network to make that connection is a paradigm shift that um, there's a good piece of the research community that's been ex exploring in the form of information-centric networking. And what we'd like to do is understand how, if we take information-centric networking, that, those concepts and, and the work that's being done on those protocols, and incorporate them in the way that we, we, we model and we build our, our mobile network. Perhaps we can transform the way we think about 5G. So what are we talking about when we're talking about ICN? And ICN comes in a couple of different flavors or a number of different flavors. Um, um, implementations you'll hear referred to as uh, name data networking or content-centric networking. Those sort of are closely related but all operate under the same principle. In any case, we're thinking about mobility as no, being, no longer being a special network function or a network requirement that only serves a subset of devices. In fact, let's think about a network that supports mobility as an emergent property. That from the design or the communication model that we're using in the network, it naturally supports mobility. Whereas today, when we think about how we've built the network, we've built a network that really enables us to, to have point-to-point -point communication from location to location. Uh, that doesn't necessarily support mobility without a lot of uh, added machinery. And so usually what we do is we abstract that machinery into a mobility overlay. Uh, we can say the same thing about security, and we can say the same thing about content, or at least storage, uh, uh, content distribution or content delivery, or at least the ability to store content places other than the points of attachment to the network. Um, so this new networking paradigm that we're talking about seeks to take mobility and sort of embed it in the, the fundamental properties of the transport network. Uh, the same thing with security uh, and the same thing with storage. So envision uh, a network that naturally supports mobility, a routed network that supports mobility, uh, that supports security to the point where every object that's delivered, one can um, be assured that that, op that that object is the object that was published and that the consumer was looking for um, in terms of the integrity of the object and storage in terms of where information can be placed within the network, that it can be dynamically moved and managed without the endpoint being concerned about it. So the principles be behind NDN or, or information-centric networking is that 
Uh, we're now going to generalize the concept of the identifier that we use in packets, uh, where today we use an IP address that then the identifier or that, that name actually is a location uh, identifier. It now becomes the name of the um, content that we're, we're looking for. Uh, so this allows sort of named operations within the network. The network is going to now operate on uh, named identifiers. It's just a generalization of what we do today. Uh, the model is a receiver-driven model. Uh, so it's um, request-based. When you want a piece of information, you ask for it, and then that information is returned. That request uh, is propagated through the network in a connectionless way. So the, the, the um, we're not talking now about, again, requiring that we have transport sessions that are connection-based, connection but rather uh, connectionless transport. Uh, that can occur over multiple paths, and we can have multiple sources and multiple paths through the network to retrieve that information. One of the underlying principles is that we have symmetric routing, that when we express a request, that request propagates in the network until it can be satisfied, and then the data is, store, is returned over the same path. And that implies that we're actually keeping some state temporarily in the network to uh, be able to retrace that path through the network. As the data is returned in a network, it can be stored. Uh, so there's the ability to temporarily cache it uh, for any number of reasons. It could be caching for um, the purpose of, of redistributing that information if it's popular content, uh, now from a closer uh, repository than, than where it was originally retrieved from. But also that same repository can be used for congestion management, for resilience and transport um, uh, retransmissions. Um, we didn't talk much about the distribution of processing in the network, but this is something that certainly will be important in 5G, especially when we're thinking about latency and its relation to the services that, that uh, an end user is looking for. The ability to distribute uh, processing through the network is, is clearly going to be something that emerges as something very important in 5G. And then finally, security which we don't do today except as an overlay. And the way we typically manage security is through end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. So we have a connection-oriented uh, solution. Uh, in the future, we can think about uh, object-oriented security, where rather than securing the connection, we secure the object that's transferred. And the interesting thing about this is that this now allows that object to migrate to different places in the network and be stored in different places in the network, say in caches that aren't necessarily trusted. So um, this sort of breaks the requirement of, of uh, sort of a, a business relationship, um, or at least the security and trust relationship between a service provider who might be operating this network and storing some of this information on behalf of a third party or the content publisher. Um, you know, the idea of, of, of um, Generalizing uh, location-based host identifiers has been a topic that's been discussed for many, many years. Uh, there are several RFCs on it. I'm talking about naming and uh, the naming of and the naming of content schemas for naming content and binding it to network des destinations. One of the nice things about abstract name or abstract names or identifiers that are location independent is now we can start to. Uh, have the network itself participate more uh, materially in uh, the information retrieval process, the routing process, and the forwarding process, caching and processing, all of that. Um, and at the same time, um, the problems that we have in our networks today that we solve through tunneling protocols or overlays, um, we can shield applications from, from uh, transport network layer issues that relate to sort of socket migration and everything, that sort of thing. Um, so in the future, um, you know, today we use host-centric APIs and talking to the network. The underlying network is, is socket-based. Um, and, and that sort of introduces some conundrums, if you will, in terms of um, operating DNS, which we normally don't even think about when we're thinking about running our applications. That's sort of something we just assume is there. 
and whenever we have the name of something that we need to resolve um, into a you know the content location mapping um, we just assume that that's tracking um, the location of that information rapidly and it's reliable uh, but that does make it difficult the fact that that can't be done very quickly does make it difficult to migrate connections transparently um, and it also um, makes it difficult sort of to connect name to location changes um, if I think about, if we're thinking about the, the objectives that we're looking for in 5G, um, we'd like to move from, I, and this came out, I think, in different words today, but this vertically integrated silo of, of network assets into a more horizontally um, structured um, network and access family that's loosely coupled. And the idea there, again, is to allow um, introduction of specialized or new air interfaces without requiring a major overhaul of either the standard or the network or the generation, which is the way we do it today. Um, we're looking to simplify the mobile architecture and possibly eliminate the need for the mobility tunnels that, that are required under in our current architecture. The idea is, is really moving towards um, a simplification of the number of protocols and the interactions between them that we have today. Intrinsic security is something that we'd like to push down into the network rather than having it as a separate after the fact concern that relates to guaranteeing the integrity of the data, privacy, confidentiality. Uh, all of those things are, are aspects that we know are important not only to the consumer but also to the, the publisher of the information and people trying to run businesses. Um, in terms of information-centric networking, the ability to support multi-homing sort of emerges from the communication model and, and the, the strategies that are used in forwarding. So we're no longer bound to um, um, uh, unique paths through the network when we're forwarding. We can broadcast, we can simultaneously send requests uh, through different paths uh, and probe at the same time, the congestion state of the network and then react to that dynamically. Um, this leads to the ability to sort of distribute traffic in a more um, uniform way without explicitly having to engineer it. Uh, improves latency um, through in-network caching and also the ability uh, to manage retransmissions uh, from more local uh, caches. Um, if you look at, at the NDN or CCN architecture itself, uh, it's really quite straightforward. Um, the, um, we have two basic kinds of packets in the network. There's an, what's called an interest packet and a data packet. And um, the interest packets are labeled by a hierarchical content name, so rather than having um, a structure where we're, we're routing on, on an IP address, we can now uh, design a routing uh, structure, forwarding structure that'll route um, based on um, a longest prefix match to, to a content name. The fact that it's hierarchical enables us to aggregate these uh, and use the same principles that we use for scaling in IP networks. Um, uh, the data packet propagates through the network uh, when, um, excuse me, the interest packet, and then uh, in the reverse direction when um, a suitable source that satisfies that interest is found, the data packet is returned. And so you can think of this as this kind of request response model uh, where the, the, uh, the data packet is delivered back to the location in the network where the request was made. And what that means is that as you move through a network or as a user moves through the network and, and expresses interests, the data is serially returned without maintaining any special state beyond um, the return state for that particular packet in the network. So that means that we don't need an explicit protocol uh, simply for managing client mobility. As the client moves um, and changes its point of attachment, its point of attachment just happening to be at layer two, uh, we know that from layer three automatically the, uh, the data will be returned to that new location. Um, in terms of what CCN routers look like, um, I'll do this really quickly. Um, 
Um, we add two new elements to a router. There's a forwarding information base in every router. Basically, all it's responsible for doing, router receives a packet, does a, a longest prefix match uh, to the address in the forwarding information base that points to the port to forward that, that um, packet. Uh, there are two new uh, entities that are introduced, what's called a pending interest table that keeps track of the interests and the, uh, enables the uh, reversed routing, if you will think of it that way, uh, to the packet when a data packet is returned. So it keeps track of the name and the port that the interest was received on and a content store. And the content store, as data packets are returned, they can be uh, optionally stored in, in, or at least the content can be stored in the content store. And then subsequent interests for that same named information can be returned from that, that uh, content store. So you can see now that as data is requested, it disseminates through the network in a very natural way without being explicitly uh, distributed by a separate protocol. Um, the question now becomes, how does this apply to 3G people, or, uh, you know, an evolution of our network? Um, so in terms of the tunneled network that we have today, uh, in the extreme view, we can envision this as being supported by more of a routed network uh, that's based on NDN. There are other um, conceptions that we can have. This is work that's going on right now in terms of how one can step through moving from our current models to uh, what would be uh, workable ICN models. And this is clear that, that this would have to interface with what would be more of a conventional uh, IP network that's, um, say, ICN un unaware. And um, so one would have gateways that would act as proxies for relaying um, sort of requests in the NDN world to a more conventional request in the IP application world. Uh, let me just, I don't want to take too much time here. There's been some studies that have been done at, um, at Orange Labs um, uh, on some of the gains that one can get in terms of average delivery time and bandwidth savings in the mobile uh, backhaul uh, that implemented um, NDN as um, in the current LTE-like network. Uh, and this was actually data that was taken or, or run on traces, so this is actual data that's that was pulled from the uh, from the Orange network, um, and in terms of, of uh, delivery time improvements, um, there was a factor of two for all content pop popular content. Actually, it, it reduced to about a third, uh, so significant latency improvement. And in terms of the usage of the bandwidth of the backhaul, oh, uh, about a forty percent gain. <clears throat> so, if we're looking ahead, what it'll take. Uh, first of all, is, is at the moment a willingness uh, on the part of those of us that are participating in the 5G discussions to actually take a risk and, and um, be somewhat aggressive at the moment and not rush to 5G decisions prematurely. And so there the appeal is just let's, uh, let's actually think a little bit out of the box that there are other kinds of solutions that we can take. In terms of the industry, uh, it would be good to understand the business impact of some of these new models, like ICN, and if this was available as a technology today, how this might change the business ecosystem and enable operators to, to uh, 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 how it would affect their, either their cost structure or their operation structure in delivering services. It's clear that at the same time we have to address the technical issues around building uh, an ICN-like model for mobility. And then finally, in order to get this into um, the, as a viable standard, there needs to be a migration path that takes us from the current 3GPP core network that we have today and the way that we design our networks today into a new model that would be supported by an, an architecture or at least a, a protocol like ICN. And that it's clear that, that that evolution path is just one that leverages the existing resources and protects all of the investment that's made in, in the current network. This is nothing new, I'll stop here, um, but let's remember that we did make the migration from the circuit switched world to the internet world, uh, while at the same time reusing a lot of the uh, assets that were deployed uh, to support um, 
um, circuit, the whole circuit switch world in the um, that that existed prior to the 1990s. So I'll stop here, and if there's a moment for a question, I'll take them now or later. talked about um, collapsing several layers um, down into sort of the core networking function. You had mobility, you had security. Um, these were similar to things that I heard discussed earlier, but it seems like maybe the idea where some of this stuff would happen might be at different layers in the stack. Like This sounded like a very layer three approach to collapsing that, and uh, what I heard maybe perhaps like from the operator's perspective would be more of a layer two. Um, do you feel like there are still some kind of differences that have to be? There are certainly a lot of differences. I mean, in in principle, you know, what one can always, you know, and the way we've solved these problems today is when there's a deficiency in a layer below, you just build something on top of it. That solves that problem. And 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 that's not always the wrong approach. You know, the idea is that the lower you go, the more generalized I think you'd like that solution. What we're finding is that that our, you know, in our routing layer, um, our network is not as expressive as it could be. And, and so by pushing some of these functions down, we can actually uh, more dynamically manage uh, things like congestion and, and uh, reliable transport in a very natural way, in an emergent way. And mobility is the same sort of thing. It just sort of comes out of that kind of a design. And since mobility wasn't really designed into the network when it was first built, and now we're understanding or we're seeing that it's a much more widely used thing, maybe this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 